exciting. My name is Dr. Leah Howard, and I am um, at Penn. I am the SNF Padilla Programs um, Student Advising and Wellness Director. And I'm teaching today a preceptorial called Contemplative Social Movements. And I'm sure you read the, the little blip, and that's what brought you here. I want to tell you just a few things. First of all, I want to remind you to mute your mic, um, but to feel free to write in the chat. A few times throughout the class, I'm going to ask you to answer questions from the chat. And then there'll be other times where I open it up to actual talking. So stay muted until that time. Um, also, we are recording this session. Um, NSO, New Story, Student Orientation, wanted this to be recorded. So we'll be recording it. The final thing I want to say uh, before we get started this morning is that I'm just so grateful to meet you all and so grateful to welcome you to Penn. Um, and it's just wonderful to see your faces and wonderful to, to welcome you here. So I hope if you haven't heard it already, the Penn faculty and staff are delighted to be with students. We've missed you all summer long and most of the spring. So we're really excited to get started. Before we start with contemplative social movements, however, I want to introduce the executive director of the Padilla program. Her name is Dr. Leah Anderson. She's going to introduce our program and then we'll get started. Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Hello, everyone. I just add my welcome. Um, we're so excited to get started with this new year. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the SNF Padilla program. Um, it is new at Penn. And the goal of the program is to foster opportunities for um, civil discourse and dialogue across difference. And by doing so, to, um, in, to cultivate a sense of wellness, service, and civic engagement among the student body and the larger community at Penn. Um, Dr. Howard works um, as part of our team. Also here with us um, are Caitlin Hendrickson, our administrative coordinator, who's waving, and uh, Lisa Marie Patzer, who is our communications director. And we are um, here for you and our goal is to help provide opportunities for you to think about how you might integrate your um, personal interest with your academic interest and your career goals, particularly around ways that all of those might come together to serve your communities. Uh, we do that through courses. Um, so there's SNF Padilla designated courses. You can look on our fabulous new website and the link for that I think will be in the chat um, and see some of the courses we have this fall and we'll, we'll soon be adding the, the um, spring courses as well. We also have a fellows program, which you all should think about. You apply in the spring of your first year. So um, if this is something you're really interested in, you can apply to be a fellow be part of a small community of students that are really passionate about these issues, have some funding um, for some opportunities to do some new and interesting things. And then finally, we also have a lot of events. Um, check out our website. You can see our upcoming events, and we encourage you to participate in as many of those as you can. They range from um, a contemplative social justice tour of the public art outside at Penn um, that will be virtual, to a student forum where students can get together to talk about um, pressing national issues um, before and during and after the fall election in the US. So I will stop here so you can get to the content you are most excited about. Um, and I'll hand it back to Dr. Howard, but I just, we are very excited you're here. If you have any questions, um, even if you're just, you know, I don't know where to go to get this or to find this, reach out to us and we're happy uh, to help and to welcome you to Penn's community. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. Um, let me just echo Dr. Anderson saying how happy we are to have you here. I want to this morning, um, so I'm going to share my screen um, and get us started, but I want to do a few things. So I hope you guys can all see my first slide there. Um, I want to introduce myself and then I want to say the questions we're going to ponder 
But then we're going to start by doing um, a contemplative uh, wellness practice. Um, we're going to do two, actually three, this session. And this session will only be an hour. So before I introduce myself, let me have another disclaimer that this subject is worthy of a dissertation. It's worthy of a semester. Um, I'm not going to get to everything, but I want to touch on things that I hope that you will explore on your own, um, big topics. Uh, but I also want to leave, we're not going to go till 1130. I want to go until around 11, 11, 10. And I want to leave the last 20 minutes to any students who want to stay after and just talk informally about anything at Penn to give you that opportunity. So I am a Penn um, alum on two different levels. I did my BA at Penn. I studied in the college. I studied um, English and French, had a wonderful experience. Um, I met my husband there, um, and then I got my PhD in political science um, at Penn as well. I taught a little bit in the critical writing program. Then I left Penn to teach political science at some other universities. March, I came back and joined this wonderful team that um, Dr. Anderson introduced to you with the Padilla program. And so that's me. Um, today, we're going to be looking at great two great big things, contemplation and social movements. And I want to try to integrate the two in an attempt to get you to think about integrating yourself, if that makes sense. I'm going to argue that contemplative practices make social movements better. And social movements are made better by contemplative practices. And at the end, we'll point to four individuals who did this in exemplary ways. And both their social movements and their humanity were enriched by both the social movement and the practice of contemplation. So before we get started, I want you to get in a comfortable spot. We're just going to do a two minute breathing exercise. And so I want you to get into a place where you can put your feet on the ground and you're seated. Make sure your feet are comfortably on the ground. And I want you to close your eyes. Again, this will just take two minutes. And I want you to take a deep breath. And I want you to imagine that you are a tree. And I want you to feel your feet on the ground pressing down like a taproot deep, deep, deep into the ground. I want you to imagine all the different tendrily roots coming out from that taproot. And imagine the deep, rich, nutrient-filled soil I want you to just breathe and feel those roots anchoring your tree to the ground. I want you to take one of those tenderly roots and travel up through the taproot, through your feet, through your legs, which are now a tree trunk. And remember to breathe as you're traveling through your core and up to your shoulders. And when you get to your shoulders, I want you to imagine that a gentle breeze is blowing through your tree. Just allow your shoulders to gently move in the breeze. And allow your neck to just relax. I want you to see your arms now. They're no longer arms, they're branches. And allow your branches to just be moved gently by the wind. Your hands are now leaves. And in a minute, we're going to take a deep breath and we're going to lift your arm branches over your head as we inhale, and then we're gonna let them down as we exhale. Okay, ready to try this? With me, inhale. And hold it. And exhale. And as you come down, feel free to let the branches move, move, move in the wind. We're gonna try one more time. Inhale. Inhale. 
and exhale it out, blow it out. We're gonna do it one last time. And this time when we inhale up and we stretch up, I want you to stretch your leave fingers all the way to the sky as much as you can and hold your breath there. Okay, ready? Inhale up and hold it and stretch your hands as far as you can to the ceiling or the sky if you're outside. And exhale, release and let your arms drop and let your head just relax and your hands come down back on your lap or your desk and open your eyes and we're gonna get started. All right, thank you guys for breathing with me. We are ready to start. We're now not trees, we're people. Okay, great. We are going to start right now. Here we go. So this picture, I'm going to show you two pictures of, of recent social movements and this, or excuse me, one recent and one past social movement. This picture comes from Philadelphia, comes from this June, this past June. And I want you to spend a minute and write in the chat some of the things you recognize in this picture. What do you see when you see um, this picture? What kinds of things um, do you see? I want you to just write a few things in the chat. If you notice, we are, um, this moment again was in June, but if we think of this moment, the summer is still going on, which it is, it's August. We are living in the middle of um, a pr of social movement. We are living in the middle of this moment, Black Lives Matter, and if you've been watching the news, what's going on in Kenosha, Wisconsin, it's still very present. Um, Jacob Blake was shot three times in front of his daughters, and people are mourning. Um, our campus, the University of Pennsylvania, is a campus with a proud history of protest. Some of you might have already been exposed to some of the things going on at Penn. Um, there's a new student disorientation where all sorts of um, interesting things are, are happening. But we're a campus that takes protest seriously. Um, and it's a big part of what's going on in the world, if you're paying attention to what's going on in Hong Kong and around the world. I want you now to look at another moment, a social protest moment, and many of you probably recognize this. Um, it's during the Civil Rights Movement in 19, I think this picture is 1963. And in the chat, just write a few things that you notice here. Notice um, similarities, differences, you might notice famous figures, but this is another moment, um, a social protest moment in our nation's history. And many folks have been comparing the two. I see really good things going on in the chat. So, so good job with your comments there. We're gonna come back to those in just a minute. But these are pictures of protests. We wanna start our time by looking a little bit at social movements. And we're gonna do the same with contemplation. But we're gonna start with social movements. We're gonna look at the what briefly, the why briefly, and the how of social movements. What we're gonna do with the, um, the what and the why will be me talking a little bit. With the how, I'm going to break you all in groups and we'll see how, how big our group is and, and how, um, how we'll do that in just a minute. But I'm gonna ask you some questions uh, for, our, for our group. But the what? So the political <clears throat> science definition, and I am a political scientist, is that a social movement is a widely shared demand for change in some aspect of the social or political order. So again, I, I think I told you I'm a political scientist, and this is from a textbook that many of you may have used in AP government. It's the Wilson DiIulio textbook. This is a standard definition of a social movement from American politics. But what is not um, necessarily privileged in that de uh, definition is how critical social movement um, are to the American experiment. And if you notice in our First Amendment, Many people, when you think of the U.S. Constitution and the First Amendment, we go right to freedom of the press. But I want you to look carefully at these other freedoms, right? Um, and I'm going to read it slowly. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. And here's what I want you to look at. Or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. 
So right there in our First Amendment, said twice, is this idea that Congress should not make a law that it inhibits or hurts the right of people to both peaceably assemble and petition the government for specific redress of, of grievances. So it's there in our Constitution, as patriotic as can be, right there, um, this um, allowance of, of people to gather peaceably. And Americans have taken that to heart. Americans do this um, knowing that they are protected that way. Now, why social movements? The interesting thing is we're watching social movements. In the chat, I want you to, and I'm going to um, figure out, I'm having a hard time seeing the chat because of my screen share, but I want you to notice right down right now for a second, why do you think people engage in social movements? Why, what do you think people and organizations seek when they protest? Why do they do it? Okay, I'll give you a minute to do that. Great. Oh, I see. Okay, you know what? Great. All right, I'm going to end the thing just for a minute. Good. Just to look at your chat, I'm going to go back to it in just a second. Excellent. You guys are saying all the things I'm looking for. Wonderful. All right, we're going to go back to sharing. Great. Huh. Okay, the sharing is stopped. Just one minute. We're going to go back to this. Okay. Just wait one second. You guys are saying good things. Keep saying your good things while I get my, okay, my screen to share. Um, great. Okay, excellent. Huh. Okay, I hope you guys can see that good. Yeah, All Leah, right. we can see it. You can see it, thank you. Yes, it's just not full screen. There you there. go. Sorry guys, we're all learning the Zoom. Thank you, Lisa Marie. Um, so you guys said all the things I was looking for. Um, people believe, there's beliefs that motivate um, people to, to join social movements. And a big set of beliefs, and you saw in the Philadelphia protests for Black Lives Matter is justice. People feel as though justice is not happening. And so they, they take to the streets for justice. Um, a friend of mine who's a rabbi calls justice uh, love with its boots on. And I love that because it's, it's that your heart is broken. You've seen something maybe like the video of George Floyd, your heart is broken because you love people and you've seen something that hurts you. And so justice means love with its boots on, you go there. So beliefs, okay? but also demands. And many of you in the chat, I noticed you were saying demands. You have actual direct benefits and demands of your government. Remember the First Amendment to address grievances, specific things. Um, you wanna change public policy. Okay, and so I wanna just look at these things. When we look, um, again, this is political science. This is um, Man Kerr Olson, uh, the logic of collective action interest groups get involved in uh, social movements because they want to influence public policy and they look for these different incentives and i put the incentives there because some of the things you were writing in the chat uh, get at these so some of the incentives some of the things that make social protests feel good is solidarity incentives because the word solidarity comes from this right you like the social aspect of it you love being with others you're fighting for others there's groups that feel good but there's also material incentives, right? There's actual benefits or things or changes um, that you want to in, in invoke. And then finally, there's purpose of incentives, larger beliefs, laws and goals that you wanna change that go beyond just the social and the material. Okay, so right now we're gonna, I've been talking way too long, so we're gonna take a minute to break into groups. And what I'm gonna do is I am going to see if, um, we can take these questions and put them in the chat. And um, what I'm going to try to do then is divide you into groups. So let me just stop the share for a second. And um, let me just see if I could put um, this into the questions I had there into the chat. And what I'd like you to do is see if you can 
copy those questions if you're on a computer that you can copy those questions and paste them when you get into your small group. So the questions should be there um, and you can paste them and put them in your small group. So I'm going to divide you guys into groups of three. And what I'd like you to do in your groups or three or four, uh, depending on our larger group, I want you to first introduce each other. Inter this is the fun of being in a preceptorial, meeting some folks. I want you to introduce um, each other, yourselves to each other. And then just simply, have you ever been involved in a protest march? If yes, how did you feel? If no, what have you noticed about others that have protested? And then how did the pen reading project readings or the documentary you watched, how did they fit um, into this discussion? We're gonna meet for 15 minutes and then I'll give you a couple notes um, while you're meeting and then we'll come right back. Okay, so 15 minutes is 1035, we'll come back. All right, so I'm gonna, you may wanna turn on your um, video for the small groups. I'm gonna try to divide you now into breakout rooms, okay? So, um, all right, this is gonna take just a few minutes to see how much, okay. Just give me one second. I think we're gonna divide you. So make sure you have the questions if you will. Maybe we'll wait for Dr. Howard to do the quick math. Um, okay, great, I'm gonna divide you into 12 rooms. Okay, guys, I'll see you soon. Welcome back. Hey guys, welcome back. Hi. I hope that was a good conversation. Good to see you. All right, guys, welcome back. I'm going to ask you to mute yourselves, which again, if we we're in a classroom, we'd just be chatting, but mute yourselves. Welcome back. You can see some people are in a good conversation and they're not leaving, but Hope you guys can exchange email addresses and okay wonderful okay welcome back those of you who are back i hope your conversations were great i'm seeing everyone's coming back thanks guys hope you met someone new <laughs> wonderful great okay welcome back guys we are going to um as folks come back in. I want you to remember to put your mute back on. Um, welcome again. Great to see so many good folks. Great. All right. So we're going to go back to, yes, so don't uh, forget to mute your mic. Great. Welcome back. All right. As people are coming in, I hope you guys had a wonderful conversation about social movements and we're able to share um, in really good ways uh, with each other about the how of social movements. Um, we are going to move into contemplation because as, as you notice, we don't have much time. We are nearing uh, getting close to 11. I wanted to spend some time with social movements and some time with contemplation and we're going to bring them together in the end through the example of four different people. So contemplation, um, this is a picture of a uh, place in the Finger Lakes in upstate New York called Watkins Glen. I don't know if anyone's ever been there. You're welcome to write about it in the chat, uh, but it was a beautiful space that my family and I visited recently. And we found this quote and we paired it with that picture to the mind that is still the whole universe surrenders by Lao Tzu. And it gets at this idea of contemplation. And I want to point out um, two other quotes like that. And these quotes, um, I want to give uh, my colleague Lisa Marie Patzer, who found the photographs, the pictures, and made these beautiful um, compilations of the quote with the, with the picture. But another quote is here from um, St. Teresa of Avila, and she says, when you have grown still on purpose while everything around you is asking for chaos, you will find the doors between every room of the interior castle thrown open, the path home to your true love unobstructed after all. So St. Teresa of Avila is a Catholic saint, and she imagined contemplation as this interior, a castle within yourself. 
Um, and last, contemplation involves listening. And this is a quote um, by Mark Nepo. To listen is to lean in softly with the willingness to be changed by what you hear. So just a couple um, quotations to get us started. But with contemplation, we wanna ask the same thing that we asked with social movements. I wanna ask, what is it? Why do people do it? And how is it done? And so just like social movements, we're gonna to try to define contemplation. And contemplation is a lot harder to define than social movements uh, are. Contemplation involves stillness. It involves infusing meaning into things. And it can be all different types of things. It involves personal introspection, looking inward as well as looking outward. It involves a deep focus on maybe a text or a natural setting or an object or something, deep focus. But the thing that I think is so important about contemplation is it involves the integration. And what I don't have on the slide that I'm mad as I look at it, um, the heart, the mind, the soul, and also the body. Contemplation brings all of the different parts of the human being together. Um, and it, it, it's a practice that you're trying to do that when you do contemplation. It involves being present to the moment. Um, and mindfulness is a way that you can be present to the moment. For some, it's an opening. For some, it's an awakening. Oh, and that's spelled wrong, that last one. Oh, here you go. Um, it's supposed to say critical distance. When you're engaging in, criti uh, in contemplation, you are able to distance yourself from the moment. You're allowed to be apart, removed. You're not influenced by what's around you. And so the critical distance is there. I just want to remind everyone to have your um, microphones muted. If you don't, we're going to have another time um, in small groups in just a sec. Okay, great. So that's what. Then how about why? Why do people engage in contemplation? And I have a few things written here, but I want you in the chat to write a few other reasons why perhaps you, if you've ever engaged in anything contemplative, why you engage in contemplation. Why do you do it? Um, if you could write that in the chat. But often um, it's because people feel fragmented and they want to bring themselves back together to integrate, reintegrate, uh, to refocus if you feel scattered, um, or if there's mental strain or stress, contemplation brings a kind of peace. I'm noticing good things in the chat around this line. It's a renewal of self-care. And again, there's other great ideas going on in the chat. I wanna give us an actual moment to practice uh, contemplation for the how. And we've done one already. We did the, the tree breathing exercise. But this next one, and let me see if I say it in the slide. We do contemplation through direct practice practicing it. It's not something you just do, uh, that you just um, have contemplative skills. It's something you build. And there's so many examples and we've done one, but we're going to do another one. And this one is called Visio Divina, which um, is just simply Latin for holy seeing or um, divine seeing. And it's looking at something. In this case, we're going to look at a painting uh, by Vincent van Gogh. And you don't have to know a thing about the painting. And you don't have to what you do is you just look at the painting and you can do this in nature, you can do this anywhere for two full minutes and you allow it to speak to you. So you just, you don't have to figure the painting out. Sometimes we look at art and we feel like we need to figure it out. Just relax and let it speak to you. What, just real, as much as you can be with the painting. Um, in art museums, they've said that uh, the typical uh, art museum visitor spends about 25 seconds, anywhere between seven and 25 seconds in front of a painting. So we're going to do two minutes and two minutes is going to seem long. Uh, but I want you to spend two minutes um, in front of the painting that I'll show you in a minute. I'm going to set my timer so you don't have to worry about it. And then right after we do that, I'm going to, we're just going to stay silent and I'm going to immediately um, break you into groups again. This, um, not sure if it'll be the same groups, but I want you in those groups simply to share what you saw. What did you see? And wh what did it say to you? Like what happened um, in that moment? And we'll spend a shorter time in our groups this time. We'll spend 10 minutes in our groups, okay? 
So we're going to start this contemplative practice called Visio Divina. So go ahead and get comfortable. I'm going to just get my timer. Um, get comfortable. And we're just going to look together at this painting by Vincent van Gogh. Okay, we're going to begin now. Okay, that's two minutes. And I'm gonna now break you into groups. Sorry, that's my timer. And just share with your, uh, with your group what you saw. Welcome back. I hope you guys are meeting good people. This is the point of preceptorials, meet good people. So welcome back, good. Welcome back. As you guys are coming back, I'm gonna put this uh, painting, it's called The Benches at St. Remy. I should have given you its title, but I didn't wanna emphasize anything just in case you had another thing that you liked besides the benches in the, in the painting. All right, guys, welcome back. I'm gonna remind you to uh, mute yourselves as you come back into the room. Welcome back, so glad to see you. I hope you had a good conversation with your group. Um, I see smiles. Good. That's good. You guys like your groups? Good, good, good. That's a good thing. Nothing's too torturous. Okay, so if you guys would mute your mics as you come back. And welcome back. Okay, so we are at, um, I'm glad you guys were in your groups and I'm glad we did this and I um, budgeted time in interesting ways. So we're coming near the end. But I want to conclude uh, by bringing together some of the ideas we talked about, or I guess I did a lot of talking and you did a lot of talking in small groups, but I want to introduce you to four people and I'm not going to introduce you to them with the amount of um, time and gravity and interest that each of these people deserves because each of these people are pretty special. And if this were a semester, we'd be, um, we'd be reading from each of them, we'd be spending a, at least uh, several weeks on each of them. But I want to, there's four people, and there could, I could have done 10 people. One is Dorothy Day, one is Cesar Chavez, one is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and one is Mahatma Gandhi. Now, you've heard probably of almost everyone, if not everyone, in this group. Um, if you're just coming back, I want to remind you about your mic. Remember to mute your mic. 
Um, so all four of these people, Dorothy Day, Cesar Chavez, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and Mahatma Gandhi lived at relatively, um, they, their lives all intersected. They lived at the same time. Um, and all four of them, though they represent different races, um, in some cases, different religions, in some cases, different countries, Dorothy Day is the only woman, um, they're, they are different, but all four cases um, melded, they brought together, they integrated um, contemplation and social movement. And in so doing, they did four things that I wanna point out today. They, one, disrupted the social order. They, two, spoke truth to power. So they disrupted the social order, they spoke truth to power. Three, they provided voice for the voiceless. And finally, they did those three things, again, in different social movements and for different reasons and with different specific causes, but they were able to disrupt social order, they were able to speak truth to power, and they were able to be a voice for the voiceless because of the critical distance that they, um, the critical distance they had and that they built over years because of contemplative practice. And because of this contemplative practice that each of the four people here had in their lives, they were able to do um, what many have called critical refusals. They were able to say no to things that the rest of society was saying yes to. And they were able to model what critical refusal looks like. In some cases, it was, you know, fasting to show what refusing food looks like as a larger uh, critique of a system um, that is, is unjust. Um, so again, their lives overlap. Dorothy Day, who's here, and I just want to tell you um, the tiniest bit about each of them, and then um, we are gonna gonna close. And if anyone wants to stay after I said, there's, um, I'd love to talk with you informally, but the tiniest bit because each of these figures has countless documentaries, movies, and excellent books about, about them. And Dorothy Day is no exception, but she lived from 1889 to 1980. Um, and she is most responsible. I want to read um, one quote from a book written by Robert Ellsberg about her. She's responsible for something called the Catholic Worker which um, even though it says Catholic was a lay movement um, that was founded in, in 1933, she fought for the poor. And she herself was not poor. She's an example of the four I'm mentioning. She went outside of her social group to advocate for people that were uh, poor. And she said, um, so I think I had a quote from her. She was born in Brooklyn. Um, and though, you know what, I thought I had a quote. Anyway, she's someone who, though she became Catholic after college, she wasn't Catholic. She considered herself an anarchist and a communist. Um, and she was investigated, oh, here it is. She was um, investigated repeatedly by the FBI. She um, was shot at multiple times. She, um, was jailed and um, also investigated, I said that already, and people um, hurled insults at her, people even within the Catholic Church. But she didn't let that dissuade her from fighting for the poor and working for the poor. And her contemplative practice, she, again, I'm going really fast through her life, but she took vows like a nun. And so I want to read this here. It says, the enigma of Dorothy Day was her ability to reconcile her radical social positions Again, she called herself an anarchist as well as a pacifist with a traditional and even conservative Catholic piety. Her commitment to poverty, obedience, and chastity was as firm as any nun, but she remained thoroughly immersed in the secular world with all the precarity and disorder that came among life with the poor. So she's someone I wanna bring up first. And again, so much more on her, please look at her. Um, more deeply. The next is Cesar Chavez. Now, Cesar Chavez lived from 1927 to 1993. So again, his life overlapped with Dorothy Day. He was born in the American Southwest. Um, he's Mexican-American, and his family owned a farm. But the farm was taken during the Great Depression. In the 1930s, his family lost 
his, their farm, and they became migrant workers, this great group of people that had no union to protect them, and so were exploited. And so Cesar Chavez grew up um, noticing the exploitation of farm workers and how poor they were in America, even when we had a robust union system. And he said, when you sacrifice, you force others to sacrifice. It's an extremely powerful weapon. What happened is he ended up forming um, the Catholic farm workers, or not the Catholic farm workers, sorry, the farm workers union. And he did so because he was um, very much inspired by others and his own sense of faith. He ended up taking a 25 day fast in 1968 um, to strengthen the discipline of the movement. Many of you maybe have seen there was a recent film um, about this. And um, Robert Kennedy and Dorothy Day visited him during that fast. It was public, but it was a practice that garnered attention. He went without in order to get others to see. And he says, um, a quote from Cesar Chavez says, when we are really honest with ourselves, we must admit that our lives are all that really belong to us. So it is how we use our lives that determines what kind of men we are. It is my deepest held belief that only by giving our lives do we find life. I'm convinced that the truest act of courage, the strongest act of humanity, is to sacrifice ourselves for others in a total nonviolent struggle for justice, to suffer for others. So this idea that suffering and nonviolence um, comes out of a contemplative moment. And both Cesar Chavez and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi were all um, social movement leaders that um, advocated for nonviolence and acted nonviolently. Now, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, I'm sure you um, remember him from our, the, the piece we read in the Penn Reading Project. He's someone that is celebrated um, in American history. Uh, but he is someone also that was a Baptist minister, and he derived uh, much purpose from his moments away. And I want to just read, you've heard probably many stories about Martin Luther King, um, but there's one story that I want to read to you, again, from this, this book by Robert Ellsberg I've been quoting from, and I can leave the, the full quote in the um, chat. But he said, a critical moment of doubt came early in his journey. One night in 1957, a death threat was delivered over the phone. He had already faced plenty of violence and hatred, but somehow the strain of the moment and the implicit threat, not only to himself, but to his family, brought him to the limit of his strength. He went into the kitchen, and as he sat there with a cup of coffee, he turned himself over to God. So it was a moment of contemplation. And this is a direct quote. Almost out of nowhere, I heard a voice, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and lo, I will be with you even till the end of the age. Afterwards, said Martin Luther King, I was ready to face anything. Right after that, his house was bombed. He experienced unlimited amounts of violence, as we know about. But that moment of contemplation crystallized for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King his purpose. And another just leader in nonviolence um, and in social movements and in sacrifice and in humanity is Mahatma Gandhi. Um, Mahatma Gandhi, his, one of the many things that he is known for is something called Satyagraha, which I probably mispronounced, uh, but it means soul force. And it's this idea that again, many uh, can describe better than myself, but this idea that you're motivated by something beyond just your desire for change, it comes from within, from the soul. And Mahatma Gandhi, who lived from 1869 to 1949, again, overlapping and um, in correspondence with many of the figures that I've already brought up today, led nonviolent movements. The greatest one was to, uh, you know, bring independence to India, but he also was involved in South Africa, um, considered the great soul of India. Um, Mahatma Gandhi, um, he, like Martin Luther King, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was martyred. Um, but I want to read, it says on January 30th, 1948, Gandhi's authority as the Mahatma or the great soul had spontaneously extended beyond his native country. 
Although his particular brand of asceticism conformed to Indian cultural norms, he was one of those examples of unquestioned holiness that goes beyond um, religion and country. So this was someone who was known for his religious practice, for his great fasting, for his great spiritual leadership. And through that leadership, he was able to lead socially to free his people. So I just, I, I wanted to give you just tastes of these four people because they're different and they manifested the marriage between contemplation and social movements differently in their specific circumstances, but they did it similarly in their critical refusals and their differences. And so the last thing we're going to do as a group is, and it's another uh, wellness practice, is reflection. And I'm going to give you just a second to do it in the chat, but I want you Today, I'd love to challenge you to spend some time with a journal or doing something on your own where you just write for a little bit. And again, in the chat, I'd love you to just give one word that if you were to create a formula that said contemplation plus social movements, what would it equal? What would that one word be? Though I welcome you, of course, in the future uh, to spend some time really journaling with many words. In the chat now, I'd love you to just write one word. And I'm going to stop my share so I can see uh, what's going on in the chat. But just, just write in the chat what, if you were to, oh good, I see some really good things. So to remind everyone, it's contemplation plus social movements. Whoa, and there's some excellent things going on in the chat. There's hope, intent, motivation, unity, determination. Um, and those people, I hope, um, exemplified that for you. Wonderful. Good, good, good. Okay, before we end today, okay, I want to say thank you to each of you for coming. I want you to know that I would love to be in touch with you. Oh, and great, I don't have my email there. Um, but I'll write my email in the chat. Um, that is my phone number and our website. I uh, really appreciate each one of you coming. Um, I'd like to create this into a course. I've been playing with it, and it might be um, an SNF Padilla course at some point, but if so, I'd love to have you in it. Um, what I'm going to do now is I am going to put my email in the chat. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, thank you all for coming. You are welcome. The formal portion is going to end, and I'm going to turn off the recording. But if you would like to stay and ask questions and meet me, I would love that too. But don't feel any pressure to do that. So my email address is that. Oh. And okay, great.